Hello, we're going to try to get some insight into inharmonicity by means of simulation. We're going to try to simulate a flexible string, one that has a zero Young's modulus, and we're going to try to simulate a stiff string that has a non-zero Young's modulus and is therefore elastic. Now, when a vibrating string generates partials that are progressively sharper than the associated harmonics, then we are observing inharmonicity. So that's the definition of inharmonicity. Now, a simulation exercises an ideal model of a real process with the goal of obtaining insight into some aspect of the process. The aspects here are inharmonicity, elasticity, and also dispersion. Uh, the key idea here is that we have an ideal model that was not going to replicate a real process exactly. Okay, elasticity is the characteristic of a body that resists deformation, deformation and tends to return to its original shape when you relieve the uh, stress. When you have elasticity, you will experience dispersion when transverse waves pass through the medium of interest. For example, light is, consists of transverse waves, and when light passes through glass, the higher frequency waves pass through more quickly than the lower frequency components, and you'll develop a spectrum. You can use a prism, for example, to demonstrate that. Vibrating string also consists of transverse waves, and the transverse waves passing through a vibrating string will also uh, ex experience dispersion because the faster frequency components will tra travel, the higher frequency components will travel faster than the slower frequency components, lower frequency components. Okay, we're going to do a simulation now first on a flexible string. We're going to plot blue, the string amplitude, along on this graph up at the top. We're going to plot amplitude along this axis and distance along the string along this axis. The string is trying to be similar to a C2 string on a piano, and it has a length of 1.49 meters. We're also going to plot the hammer position, because right here is where we're going to strike the string at one-eighth of the speaking length. And we're going to also plot the hammer force, but it'll be plotted versus distance. Down here, we're going to plot things versus time. I'm going to plot the hammer position again, the hammer force again, and the bridge force. The bridge force will result when the string at the bridge point over here is either pulling up or pulling down on the bridge, causing a, a vertical force component. Initially, the string is flat, so there's no vertical component, so there's no bridge force. Okay, let's start the simulation. Okay, you saw the hammer force rise at the point where the hammer is striking the string. You saw the shape of the wave start to develop. Now up here, there's two things are going to happen. Uh, a wave consists basically of two components, one that moves to the right and one that moves to the left. And right now it's symmetrical because those two components have not been reflected. But the one moving to the left here will reach the graph quickly and it'll be reflected. And when it is reflected, it will be inverted and it'll come back after reflection and it will subtract from the amplitude of the main wave. The component that moves to the right will not have been reflected by that time. You'll see it continue to move to the right for about 15 milliseconds until it actually reaches the bridge, at which time it'll be reflected and inverted also. So the overall shape of the curve, the blue trace here, 
is the consequence, is the sum of these two components. Down here I'm plotting the hammer position in green. The hammer came up. And I'm plotting the force that results from the hammer coming, striking the string, compressing the felt. Okay, let's continue the simulation. Okay, now uh, we've got a reflection and we see the waves start to move to the right. We've got an interesting little hump here. Consequence of this reflection off of the graph. We see down here the hammer came up, reached a peak, came back down, and started towards its rest position. We see the force of the hammer on the string as a consequence of the compression of the felt, rising to a peak, coming down, and then coming back up again. And we'll explain this in a few minutes. Okay, let's continue the simulation. The uh, wave has not reached the bridge yet, so the bridge force plotted down here in black is still zero because we're not the, the string is horizontal at the bridge. It's, it's pulling sideways, but not it has no vertical component. Now we're pulling up on the bridge because here's the string. The string's under tension, and it's pulling up on the bridge in, a, in a, an amount proportional to the tension in the string. Over here we see that the bridge force has started to rise. Okay, let's let the string be reflected and inverted and set it back the other direction. Okay, inversion, reflection, and it comes back. Now we have a negative amplitude string moving this direction towards the a graph. We had a rise in the bridge force when the string was over here pulling up, and then we have a negative force when the wave, when the wave was pulling down it just after uh, the reflection started. It was being inverted. So we have a whiplash force pulse here showing the effect of the string pulling on the bridge. Let's continue the simulation. Reflection off the graph, reflection off the bridge, another force pulse, and finally another force pulse. And We'll stop the graphing of the simulation here at about 46 milliseconds. So we have three whiplashes here. Up, down, force on the bridge from the string. <coughs> Second one, the third one. And you can see, since we're plotting this versus time, you can see they're spaced apart about 15 milliseconds. <coughs> and this makes sense because the fundamental frequency of the C2 key is 65.4 hertz which calculates back to a period of 15 or so milliseconds. So that means that we're going to be generating a wave of force of the string acting on the bridge. This is going to be a wave in here in black. And that wave is definitely going to have a fundamental component of 65.4 hertz. It's going to have some higher frequency components too because of the shape of this pulse. <coughs> If this black trace were a pure sine wave with, with a period of 15 or so milliseconds, then we would have a single fundamental component in the bridge force and no higher harmonics. Okay, let's take a look at a stiff string this time. Okay, and we're going to plot the same quantities. maximize it and here we start this start the simulation hammer strikes wave gets started so once again we have the initial wave before reflection off of the a graph and way before reflection off of the bridge have the same shape in the hammer position the green and we have the same shape in the force of the hammer on the string Right, let's continue the simulation. Okay, now we get a reflection off of the a graph, causing the shape to develop. All right, now we have a similar shape in the force that we had before for the flexible string. 
See this red trace is similar. The shape of the hammer position is similar. The wave shape is fairly similar to what it was before, but we'll see something different once the string reaches the bridge and once it's reflected. Now, the other thing we notice right away, perhaps, is that we have a little bit of a leading component here. See, the wave just doesn't come down to the zero level and stop like it did for the flexible string. It's got some little ripples up ahead of it, and these ripples are a consequence of the higher frequency components leading the main body of the wave. All right, let's continue the simulation. Okay, reflection about to take place. We see the force of the bridge, force of the string on the bridge start to develop. Right away we see there's a little difference. We have a little bit of a dip before that happens because of those leading ripples. Some of those lip ripples that were led were actually a negative amplitude and they were pulling down on the bridge a little bit. So we have a different looking, this right here, this bridge force shape is a little bit different than over here. All right, let's continue. Okay, we have a full whiplash on the uh, string, the string force on the bridge. And you can see that it is quite different in shape, this versus this, than it was for the flexible because of those, because of the dispersion. Continue. Reflection off the graph, reflection off of the Notice the ripples that lead here. They're quite pronounced. Okay, so now we have three whiplashes down here, and you can notice that they're all different because the faster components are getting further and further ahead of the main body of the wave, and it's generating these little ripples out front. So we're getting some earlier effects with the stiff string than we were with the flexible string. In other words, the force for the stiff string is leading that of the flexible string. Now take a look at some of the more some of the activities right after the hammer strike. Here I'm plotting several quantities versus time. I'm adding one new quantity here. The black trace is the amplitude of the string <coughs> at the hammer strike point. I'm also plotting the velocity of the hammer down here. And here's the compression of the felt. Here's the force. And here's the hammer position. So we start out with the hammer rising. And it's driving it contacts the string and it drives the string up, but you can see that the amplitude of the hammer is greater than that of the string because there's compression. And the compression is the amount of the difference between these two traces, the green and the black. And you can see that the blue, which is the compression, reaches a, <coughs> a peak right here because right around here, here's the black and here's the green. It's the greatest difference. As the string starts to respond, it starts to follow the hammer, and up in here, the compression is getting less because the black and the green are getting close together, so the compression is it has a little local minimum. The force is a function of the, a nonlinear function of the compression, and you can see it has a peak early on, then it comes down as the compression comes down, goes back up, because this little dip here in the amplitude of the string at the point where the hammer strikes uh, is experiencing that reflection from the graph and it's changed its shape and so right here for example the distance between the hammer and the string starts to get larger again and this compression starts to get larger and as does the force. So we have these this double peak in the force and it all takes place within about three milliseconds of the beginning of the hammer strike. Hammer retracts to its rest position 
and the velocity is negative as it retracts and it stops over here when it actually reaches the rest position. About 15 milliseconds later, you see this black trace, the amplitude at the point where the hammer strikes, starts to go negative. And this is a consequence of the reflection from the bridge. And it happens about 15 milliseconds later because that's how long it takes for the wave to reach the bridge from the point where the hammer struck. Here are some pictures of the force of the string on the bridge, which is then, as I've said earlier, going to drive the soundboard, and then which in turn will drive the sound waves that we hear. Okay, I'm plotting both of them on top of each other up here, and plotting them separately down here. Here's the flexible, here's the stiff, here they're together. And when you plot them together, you see that, for example, the flexible does not change its shape, the stiff does, but the stiff also leads the flexible, and it leads it more and more. And this is this lead is the reason why we have inharmonicity. This lead, of course, is a consequence of the dispersion, which then causes the inharmonicity. Now let's take a look at the spectral analysis. Here is the spectrum of the flexible model, the stiff model, and I'm also showing the harmonics in dotted black. So over here is the fundamental at around 65.4 hertz. So I'm plotting frequency along this axis and decibels along this axis. Power in decibels. You see at this particular point the curves basically line up on top of each other. The flexible and the stiff both have a first partial at the fundamental. And as the frequency increases, you start to see kind of a dispersion here, and, or a consequence of a dispersion. For example, you start to see right here the flexible in red, its harmonic lines right up with its partial lines up right with the harmonic. The stiff partial starts to get a little bit sharp of the harmonic. And as the frequency gets higher and higher, you get more and more of a separation between the harmonics and the stiff partial. The flexible partials still stay right on the harmonics. Here then finally is a picture of the stiff partials plotted along with the partials from an actual C2 from, a, from my piano at home here. And you can see initially they're pretty much together at the first partial at the fundamental. And then as time as we get higher and higher frequency, we start to get a separation. Uh, for example, right over here. We have, let's see what we got here. Yeah, we've got here's the harmonic, and both the model and the real key are sharp relative to that harmonic. Uh, you can see that the model does not fit the actual key perfectly and it was not meant to be because the model was ideal and because we were trying to gain insight into inharmonicity, dispersion, and elasticity. And I hope we've accomplished that and I thank you for listening and watching.